Hi everyone and thank you again for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, we're gonna have a look at the PL1 series of lights from iFootage. These are 80 watt panel lights. Now over here we have their BN version, which is sort of a bicolor light, not really, but we'll call it a bicolor for the moment. This has a CCT range from 2,700 Kelvin up to six and a half thousand Kelvin. Now both lights can run off V-mount batteries. They have DMX capabilities. And in addition to that, they're not just a soft light panel, but they also have a 45 degree spot. Now this light here sells for about 300 US dollars. Now for $50 more, you can get the RGB WW version. This light has a CCT range from 2,700 Kelvin up to 10,000 Kelvin with plus minus green magenta capabilities and also has all of your color modes. Now I know what you're thinking, why would you want to save 50 bucks and buy the bicolor light? Well, it's not actually a bicolor light, I'm going to call it variable white because this thing has warm white, cool white, blue and lime color emitters. So it enables it to track to the Planckian curve, but in addition to that, it fills out the spectrum and gives amazing color render. This is the ADC at 5,600 Kelvin. And this is the ADBN. So as you can see, it's not as simple as picking between full color and no color. You get superior color render with this unit, making it a bit of a difficult choice. All right, let's start off the review by going through the combined pros and cons for both. And I think the first pro is the form factor. It's a very lightweight, very compact unit. 80 watts of output, that's pretty powerful. Now, even if you've got a mini V-mount battery uh, attached to the unit powering it, it is still a very lightweight form factor. Very, very nice indeed. Now, if you don't have mini V-mounts, one possible negative uh, that you, you might encounter is the weight will be top heavy. So if you've got a big brick battery like this, it, it could become a little bit unwielding if you're uh, a bit slack with your lock offs. So that is something to bear in mind. Now I can't think of any better position for them to have put the V-mount. I think that is the best spot for it. Now a few people have uh, criticized the fact that it's using V-mount. They said, oh, maybe it should use um, the, those little Sony batteries. I think V-mount's the way to go because this thing has 100 watts of power draw. So that's quite a bit. Now you can also power it off its DC port, which is 15 to 30 volts. And you can power it off USB-C with a PD 100 watt system. Now, in terms of other pros for the unit, the build quality is sensational. It's built of an industrial plastic or a polymer and it feels very solid. The cooling fans are very quiet. They haven't been a problem at all. In fact, this is running in its loudest settings and you can't hear it. I'm standing right next to it. Now, when I first got them, I had to look inside to see if the fans were actually running. They were that quiet. Okay, in terms of other pros, metal stirrup, metal lock-offs, and a metal ratchet handle. And the lock-off can easily take the weight of a solid battery. That won't be a problem at all. Now the menu system is pretty straightforward, but it does have some good options like dimmer curve and studio mode, as well as all the usual special effects that you'd expect from a light of this caliber. However, effects like candle and fire are not so great. In terms of accessories, the accessory slot is very well designed, has fantastic metal lock-offs. This is actually metal and it is spring loaded so you can easily get the accessory slot out of the way. Now in terms of another pro, in the front of the accessory slot here for the diffuser is a micro switch. Now this micro switch enables the light to detect when the diffuser has been put in. Now this is a pro and a con. So with the current firmware, it is a pro in this unit and it is a con in that one. We'll get to that in a second. It has a secondary slot here for barn doors. So the units are sold with barn doors. Now I'm not a huge fan of barn doors on a light that's this small or, or a panel light this small. The way I see it, it just adds additional space and it doesn't do a very good job of cutting the light at all. So I think barn doors are a little bit 
of a waste of time. That brings me to my next negative for both the lights. There's no options for a honeycomb. And I think that's a big mistake. If these had a honeycomb option, that would be fantastic for me. Now they do have the uh, native 45 degree spot, but the way that drops off isn't as beautiful as you get with a honeycomb. Now, in terms of cons for both of the units, the first con for me is if you're running it off V-mount batteries. There is some green magenta hue shift when you're running off the V-mounts. Now, it's not really enough that you're gonna notice it by eye. The only reason I noticed it is because I'm doing comprehensive testing for this gear review. The big overwhelming negative for me with these lights is the display. It's a liquid crystal display. When you get on certain angles, you can't read any of the information that's on the display. And the last negative for both the lights is hopefully a temporary one, which will be fixed in the next firmware. In terms of DMX, they're pretty much useless because unless they're set to a DMX start address of 001, they just won't function. Now you can set other DMX start addresses, but it simply doesn't work. All right, so let's go over the pros and cons of the ATBN. That's the variable white unit, not the full color. Now, the overwhelming pro with this unit is the color render. The color science is amazing. I've got a little bit more detail in that further down the episode, so you can go over all of that data. Now, um, the one thing they have absolutely nailed on this is the diffuser recognition. So when it comes down and presses that micro switch, the light switches over to another set of calibrations to get you a perfect match between the raw LEDs and the diffuser. So how accurately have they got this? Well, in my opinion, this is the gold standard in terms of recognizing accessories. I can't tell how accurate they've got it because a handheld spectrometer doesn't have enough accuracy. This is somewhere between absolutely perfect and about plus or minus 12 Kelvin. In terms of its white point accuracy, Delta UV, I'm reading differences of plus or minus 0.0001 Delta UV. So uh, if you've got a handheld spectrometer, you know that that is within the tolerance of the spectrometer. So absolutely 100% nailed it. They've got that right. That is the gold standard for other manufacturers to try and follow. Now, in terms of little quirks with this, there are some differences in your Delta UV or your white point between running off battery and running off the power supply coming in through the DC. Now, in terms of your low Kelvins, say 3200 Kelvin, for example, if you're running off the V-mount battery, it will be 100% spot on or as close as you can get to spot on. We're talking about plus or minus three Delta UV down around those low Kelvin. So it's riding right on the planking curve. If you're running off AC, it seems to be running a little bit higher, somewhere uh, around under the equivalent of a half of a one eighth correction gel, so not really noticeable. If you're running it at 5,600 Kelvin, if you're running it off AC, it seems to be right on the daylight curve, perfectly tracking to the daylight curve. And if you're running it off V-mount, it seems to be a little bit lower, but you wouldn't notice it unless you got a color spectrometer. All right, let's go through the pros and cons of the ATC now. So this is the RGBWW unit. Now, in terms of pros, with no diffuser in, this tracks to the planking curve with insane accuracy. It is one of the most accurate tracking lights that I have ever come across. Now, in terms of possible negatives for people, this doesn't deviate and track up to the daylight curve. It just tracks to the planking curve. Now, this light doesn't have the fancy color science that's in the ATBN, but between 2,700 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin, its lowest TN30 color render score was a very impressive 95. Now let's get into the negatives. So this light also has um, a micro switch for recognizing when the diffuser is put in, but unlike the other light, they haven't nailed it. They've actually totally stuffed it up. So when you put a diffuser in, uh, the diffuser is a little bit green because all of the LEDs mix together slightly differently. But instead of adding magenta, it looks to me like they've added more green. So I'm not gonna give you the stats on that because that's a firmware thing. They'll no doubt have that fixed up sooner or later. But if, you're, um, if you've bought one of these and you're using it and you're thinking, geez, it looks a little bit green, uh, what I'd suggest is rather than putting the diffuser in the slot, just tape it to the outside for the moment. And then when they do the next firmware update, then you can put it in the slot. 
So you're probably thinking, why not just use the green magenta correction? Well, with the current firmware, the green magenta correction, in my opinion, is far too coarse. So you've currently got only 10 increments of plus green and 10 increments of plus magenta. Now here's the thing, each increment of adjustment is quite a big step. I think they need to refine it down, maybe to at least half the value on each step. The DMX, so the DMX on this unit sounds very impressive on paper. It's got CCT HSI, it's got CCT RGB, and a CCT XY profile as well as other profiles. Now here's where it's a little bit of a letdown. Those profiles are not crossover profiles. So the CCT HSI profile, for example, you can have your CCT mode and then you can switch to your HSI mode. Whereas with uh, the more complex lights that we're used to owning as gaffers, you can select a CCT, a plus minus green value, and then mix a color in. You can't do that with these, so that's a bit of a letdown. In terms of the next negative with these, they have a HSI mode, hue, saturation, and intensity. But in terms of desaturating, it desaturates to the one white point. You can't select a Kelvin or a plus minus green value for it to desaturate to. Now that's not necessarily a negative for the price because it is only 350 US dollars. Here's my negative, that white point is quite green. So they could really do with recalibrating the white point that the HSI mode desaturates to. Now the next thing I'm going to mention isn't a pro or a con, it's just something to let you know is there, and that is the light has an expansion mode. So it'll enable you to extend the CCT range at both ends. Now expansion modes, the color render isn't that great. They've put in there just to give you the option if you need it for like some sort of effect shot. So with the expansion mode, you can go from 20,000 Kelvin all the way down to 1,400 Kelvin. Now, like I've said, the color render isn't great on these extended CCTs, but they are there as an option. Okay, let's quickly go over cost and what you get for your money. So the ATBN, that's the variable white unit, that sells for about 300 US dollars. And the ATC, that's the full RGB unit, that sells for about 350 US dollars. Now, when you buy them, they do ship to you in a large box like this, which has plenty of padding inside it. So everything gets to you in one piece. All right, so let's have a look what you get in that box. And I've got it all consolidated here. So you get a very good bag. And look, a lot of lights come with bags, but this actually is a really good bag. All right, so uh, let's start going through. You get your instruction manual and some stickers and uh, other paraphernalia. All right, in the uh, side pouch here, everything is separated. So you've got your regional power cable that you get, which is a um, IC lead at one end and you get your power supply. Now your power supply has a V mount on it so you can mount it onto the back of the light and also has, has a hook here so you can put it on the light stand if you prefer to do that. Now here's what I really like about this bag. All right, let's say you're having a really bad day at the office and you go to pick up the bag and you haven't got it um, zipped up properly. Nothing falls out, it's all secured. So the light is very securely strapped in and you've got a Velcro section here, which has your barn doors and you can also put your diffuser in if you wish. All right, so that's pretty much what you get. Let's have a look at how the lights perform. All right, let's have a look at the ADBN. First off with no diffusion. Now here I'm standing about two meters away from the wall. So you can get a good idea of the beam shape. As you can see with the drop off, the 45 degree beam is more of a hot spot with a lot of drop off to the sides, which is why I would have really have liked to have a honeycomb option with this system as well. And one thing to note on the edge of the beam, there's no noticeable change in color hue. Now let's have a look at the ADBN with its diffusion attached. And as you can see, it works as good as any other soft light panel. A beautiful, large, even spread. But this beautiful even beam does come with a trade-off. You're getting less than one third the light level that you were without the diffuser on. All right, let's have a look now at how the ADC performs. First off with no diffusion. Just like with the ADBN, 
the ADC's 45 degree beam angle is more like a 45 degree hotspot with a lot of drop off towards the sides. Which again is why I would have loved to have seen some honeycomb solved with this system. On the edge of the beam, there is a little bit of color hue towards green, but it's well under that of the equivalent of one half of a one eighth correction gel, so you'd need a spectrometer to see it. Now in the color modes, you've got the same color across the beam. It might not look like it here because my camera was getting freaked out. Now let's have a look at the ADC with its diffuser attached. And just like with the ADBN, this gives a beautiful even light spread. The results are the same regardless of the CCT that you dial in. And the colouring is consistent from edge to edge in the HSI mode. Now let's have a look at how these lights perform over DMX control, starting off with the ATBN. And just to note, if you want to run these off DMX, you're going to need the optional USB-C to DMX adapter cables. Okay, let's have a look at how the ATBN responds to DMX commands. It is receiving its commands via an external CRMX receiver. Regardless of if you were sending your commands hardwired or via CRMX, the responses are the same. And it is running off an 8-bit two-channel profile. To give you something to compare it to, I have an Astera tube, which is also running off CRMX. Both lights will be receiving their commands at the same time. Let's start off with instant on-off commands. Now for some half-second cues. Now for some one second cues. And now for some two and a half second cues. And now some five second cues. Now let's have a look at some CCT changes between 5600 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin, starting with instant changeovers. Now for some half second changeovers. Now for some one second changeovers. Now for some two and a half second changeovers. And now for some five second changeovers.
Now let's have a look at how the ATC, that's the full color unit, performs with its DMX testing. The light is running off profile one, which is a six channel CCT HSI profile. This is an eight bit profile and the light is receiving its commands via an external CRMX receiver. Regardless of if it's receiving its commands via CRMX or hardwired, the results are the same. To give you something to compare it to, I have a sky panel S60C, which is also running off an 8-bit CCT HSI profile and is also receiving its commands via an external CRMX receiver. Both lights have their dimmers set to linear. Now, just to stop anybody jumping to the wrong conclusions about brightness, the sky panel is running through one f-stop of ND. Let's start the testing with instant on-off commands. Now let's take a look at some half second cues. Now for some one second cues. Now for some two and a half second cues. And now for some five second cues. Now let's have a look at CCT changeovers between 5,600 Kelvin and 3,200 Kelvin, starting with instant changeovers. Now for some half second changeovers. Now for some one second changeovers. Now for some two and a half second changeovers. Now for some five second changeovers. Now at this point in the DMX testing with a full color gamut light, I usually do CCT and HSI crossover tests, but this light doesn't have a CCT HSI crossover mode. It's a hard switch mode. So what I've decided to do is just give you a couple of examples of what would happen if you forgot about that and you had this set up in an environment where you're doing a crossfade from a CCT to a color hue. Let's have a look at a two and a half second crossover. and a five second crossover. Now for the next bit of testing, I'm doing something a bit different to other episodes. Because this light doesn't have a CCT HSI crossover mode, 
I'm now doing the desaturation testing in its HSI mode. Now, I mentioned earlier in the episode that this desaturates to a fixed Kelvin point and that Kelvin point is quite green. So to give you some idea of how green it is without giving you fancy details and numbers, I've decided to set the sky panel to a matching CCT, but I haven't dialed in a matching green value on the sky panel. Both lights are set to zero plus minus green. Let's start off the testing with instant changeovers. Now let's do some half second changeovers. Now for some one second changeovers. Now for some two and a half second changeovers. And now for some five second changeovers. Let's take a look at the data I've collected for the ADBN, starting off with the CCT accuracies. From 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus 79 Kelvin. From 4,050 Kelvin to 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus 116 Kelvin. From 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus 112 Kelvin. And from 6,050 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 30 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at the color render measured in TM30RF. At 2,700 and 2,750 Kelvin, it comes in with its lower score of 95. From 2,800 to 3,050 Kelvin, it comes in with 96. From 3,100 Kelvin to 4,300 Kelvin, it goes up to 97. And from 4,350 Kelvin upwards, it has its highest score of 98. Now let's take a look at the white point placement measured in Delta UV. From 2,700 Kelvin to 4,000 Kelvin, it has an average Delta UV of plus 0.0012, which means the light at this point has an ever so slight green hue to roughly the equivalent of one half of a one eighth correction gel. From 4,050 Kelvin to 5,000 Kelvin, I don't have an average because the light at this point starts tracking away from the planking curve and up to the daylight curve. From 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, if your camera's working to the daylight curve, this is smack on, with an average delta UV of plus 0.0033. And from 6,050 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin, it is still tracking very accurately to the daylight curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0038. Okay, let's take a closer look at some of the Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 2,700 Kelvin, I got 2,833. The TN30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0012, which would make the light arguably imperceivably green to roughly the equivalent of one half of a one eighth correction gel. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,255 with an SSI score of 90. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0012, which would make the light at this point almost imperceivably green to roughly one half of a one eighth correction gel. 
Now let's take another look at 3200 Kelvin, but this time with the light running off a of V-mount battery. This time I got 3205 Kelvin with an SSI score of 91. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. All of the CRI scores were plus 90. In fact, with the exception of R12, all of the CRI scores were plus 95. Here is the spectrum distribution. And it came in with a perfect white point of zero delta UV. Now let's take a closer look at some of our other Kelvins, starting off with 4,400 Kelvin, and we're back to having a look with the AC power supply attached. At 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,527. The TN30 color render results were a very impressive 98% color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0020, which would give the light at this point a green hue, but still under that of a 1 8 correction gel. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,706 with an SSI score of 82. The TN30 color render results were 97% average color accuracy with an average 99% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are above 95. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0033. So if your camera is working to the planking curve, this light will be slightly green to a little bit more than the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. But if your camera is working to the daylight curve, this is smack on. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 6,500, I got 6,419. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 99% color saturation. All of the CRI scores are plus 95. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0040. Now let's take a look at all the data I've collected for the ADC, starting off with the dimming characteristics. Let's take a look at the dimming characteristics at 3200 Kelvin first. I've taken readings at 100%, 50%, 10%, and 5%. The CCT is very consistent. The color accuracy is very consistent. And there is a little bit of movement in the white point or delta UV, but nothing you wouldn't notice unless you're taking readings with a spectrometer. At 5600 Kelvin, the CCT is again very consistent. There is a little bit of change in the color accuracy. And there is a little bit of movement in the delta UV or white point. But again, you wouldn't notice this unless you had a color spectrometer. Now let's take a look at our average CCT accuracies. From 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, it is typically off the target value by plus 79. From 4,050 to 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically off the target value by an average of 151. And from 5,050 to 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically off the target value by an average of 265 Kelvin. Now let's take a look at our white points measured in delta UV. Now this light does not deviate to the daylight curve. It is tracking purely to the Planckian curve and with incredible accuracy. From 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, it has an average accuracy of plus or minus 0.0003 delta UV. From 4,050 Kelvin to 5,000 Kelvin, that accuracy is an even finer plus or minus 0.0001. And from 5,050 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 0.0006. Now let's take a look at color render scores measured in TM30RF. At 2700 and 2750, it came in with a 96. From 2800 Kelvin to 3000 Kelvin, it comes in with a 97. From 3050 Kelvin to 5500 Kelvin, it drops back down to a 96. And from 5550 Kelvin to 6000 Kelvin, it's back up to 95. And all the way up at 10,000 Kelvin, this light is still coming in with a respectable 92. Let's take a closer look at some of our Kelvins now, starting off with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in on the non-extended CCT range. Now, all of these readings were taken with the light running off AC power with no diffusion in the front. When I dialed in 2,700 Kelvin, I got 2,799. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R11 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point was super accurate with a delta UV of plus 0 0.0001. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,266. 
with an SSI score of 87. The TN30 colour render results were 96% average colour accuracy with an average 103% colour saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R11 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a very accurate delta UV of plus 0.0006. So that would make the light at this point imperceivably green to roughly the equivalent of one quarter of a one eighth correction gel. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,499. The TN30 color render results were 96% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point was super accurate with a delta UV of plus 0.0002. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,852 with an SSI score of 76. The TN30 color render results were 95% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0006. So if your light's working to the planking curve, this is pretty close to perfect. But if you're working to the daylight curve, it'll be noticeably green to a bit more than the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. Now let's take a quick look at some of our higher Kelvins. I've taken readings at 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 and 9,000 Kelvin. When I dialed in 10,000 Kelvin, I got 11,495. The TN30 color render results were 92% average color accuracy with an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores R9, R11 and R12 were below 90. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is still tracking to the planking curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0012. Now let's take a look at the extended CCT range. Now I normally don't bother doing this because the extended CCT values are usually pretty rubbish, but I'm so curious because this has a massive extended CCT range, how the spectrometer is going to cope. So let's have a look at the lowest CCT, 1400. When I dialed in 1400 Kelvin, it was out of range of my spectrometer to get a CCT reading. It is also out of range of the TN30 color render tests. You also can't get a CRI score, here is the spectrum distribution. And you also can't get a delta UV reading, but at least you can see where it is on an XY. Now let's have a look at how it goes at 2000 Kelvin, because I know at 2000 Kelvin, the light is within the parameters for the testing. When I dialed in 2000 Kelvin, I got 2160. The TN30 color render results were 28% average color accuracy with a 74% average saturation. Now you see how some of these colors are skewing in the wrong direction? That is how you can end up with negative CRI scores. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point comes in with a delta UV of plus 0.0015, which will give the light at this point an ever so slight green hue to well under the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel if you don't dial any plus or minus green magenta correction in. Now let's take a look at the very top Kelvin, 20,000. When I dialed in 20,000 Kelvin, I got 26,882. Again, this is outside the range of a TM30 color test. Much to my surprise, the CRI results came in better than I expected. And the white point came in with a delta UV of plus 0.0044. Let's take a look at how accurately the light can dial in its color vectors. Red, which should be 0 degrees, was smack on at 0 degrees. Green, which should be 120 degrees, was smack on 120 degrees. Blue was smack on at 240 degrees. When I dialed in 60 degrees or yellow, I got 53 degrees. But I'd recommend dialing in 29 degrees if you want a good looking yellow. When I dialed in cyan or 180 degrees, I got 223 degrees. And when I dialed in magenta or 300 degrees, I got 256 degrees. And here is the desaturated white point in the HSI mode. All right, so my closing thoughts, the ADC. Well, I think with a few more firmware updates, this would be absolutely amazing, absolutely sensational. Now, it's a very good light for the price, but I'm talking in terms of comparing it with $5,000, $6,000 lights, all it needs is some firmware adjustments in my opinion. Now, the bicolor light here, the BN, impressive color science on that, you have to admit. All right, I'm Andrew Locke. See you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear.